Welcome to the Complexity Theory Podcast. My name is Zach McCormick. I am a lawyer, but this is not legal advice. Today, my guests are Ben and Eve Passmore. They are currently brewers in a local microbrewery, and there's a lot more there. I think you're going to enjoy their story. Ben and Eve, thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, glad thanks to for here. having us. This is fun. So we were kind of talking before we started rolling. Um, there's so much to your your story. It's it's almost difficult to know where to start. Um, but as I, as I mentioned just a moment ago, you know, right now, you both run a successful up and coming local brewery. But I think it would be kind of interesting to hear how you've how you've gotten to that point, even though the brewery itself is interesting. And incidentally, shameless plug, I love your stuff. I've tried all your flights, except the IPAs. I just, I'm just not into the IPAs for some reason. We'll get you there. We'll get you there. (laughs) And it's delicious. And we've actually got quite a few breweries in this area. And so that's not just me blowing smoke. It's competitively delicious. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. So, so tell me, how do, how did it all come about? How did you end up here in Mount Dora, Central Florida, run on a brewery. Hmm. Yeah, so um, we we have different gifting sets, right? And so I think that um, this brewery, Eden Abbey, is an expression of our different sets of gifts coming together and working together very cohesively. Eve is fantastic at hosting, hospitality. She's always been the person inviting and starting the party, you know, um, loves to make people feel valued and taken care of. And she's excellent at it. And I'm great at hiding in the dungeon and making things. <laughs> Do you and let him out once in a while just to get some sunlight? <laughs> just make the appearance. Uh, I'm, I'm better more one-on-one and, um, developing concepts and visions and projects and, and focusing on kind of long-term goals. And so, um, yeah, we've had to learn a lot, but so I think it's just the, the culmination of, of years and years of figuring out what it is exactly we can handle in life and letting our grid be smashed over and over again. So, um, your grid is, be smashed. Yeah. Meaning you, you get a grid in a worldview and you think you've got life figured out and then it gets smashed and you have to readjust and have to develop a new grid for life and what you're comfortable with operating in long term and so i think that we've we've discovered that this uh brewery endeavor is way more than we can handle and we're regretting it every day (laughs) i'm just kidding (laughs) that's much bigger than us but you asked how we got here and i think um to uh compact that into somewhat of a brief history um we got inspired to go overseas uh, before we were even married and then we had our first child and waited about 18 months and then the timing was right and that was through a series of um, just these strange network connections where um, an idea a seed got planted in us and it became a dream a desire to go overseas and help with a, a small missions organization over there and during those those years we developed um, the skills that made something like what we're doing now possible and I think the, the network of trust and reputation, which is really what anybody has at the, at the core, right? Like if you don't have your reputation and trust, then you're not going to do much. So now, now there's, there's a lot here. And I suppose that I have not really fleshed out some of the things that really jumped out. You guys have so many things, but the, but when I heard that you, when I heard that you, New, new parents still, with an 18-month-old, decided to go from, where was it, Kansas? We were Kansas in City? Kansas City, yeah. Kansas City, okay. And you're like, okay, we're going to move, right? I'm thinking, they're thinking, you know, let's, let's talk Chicago, let's talk, you know, West Coast somewhere, maybe you're going down to the Gulf, like, you know, New Orleans or something like that. No, you guys are like, if it's not an island in the middle of the Mediterranean, We're not in like (laughs) full stop Kansas City to Malta. And for those folks who are listening who don't really know what or where Malta is, it's an island in the middle of the Mediterranean, basically just north of Tunisia. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And and it's got 
all this history, right? Mm -hmm. Because in essence, it was what? It was sort of a midpoint for travelers from Europe to the northern portion of Africa. There were, there were what? There, were, there was piracy, right? The, yep. the Barbary Coast. You would have had that be an outpost for what? English. You would have had it be an outpost for those Barbary pirates. You would have had what? Everything else. So you guys are just like, that's where we're going. Yeah. And not just that. We're going to run a pub. Yeah. Well, eventually. That was yeah, eventually that <laughs> happened. Yeah. That happened. And that's why, that's why when I said, how did you get here, right? Mm -hmm. We're talking about Kansas City to Malta. There's, there's a few other steps in between before you land in Mount Dora, right? Mm -hmm. But how you guys have, have a, a baby still. How do you come to that conclusion? How does Malta become the place? Yeah, well, that was, um, like Ben mentioned, a, a family connection. So we had, um, had an organization that was based in Malta that was doing humanitarian and missional work in North Africa in the Middle East, and they had a staffing need. Um, and both Ben and I had always been drawn to, um, you know, other nations, other cultures and that sort of thing. So we were young and dumb and adventurous and just thought, okay, that sounds like fun. And, and look, it uses some of our skill sets. I, um, as Ben mentioned, it was very into hospitality. And so the role that I was going to be playing with this organization was mostly administrative and, and, um, hospitable. They had a lot of people coming out of North Africa and the Middle East who were short-term workers or mm. long-term but would have to leave every three months to renew their visas or something like that. And so I was going to be handling a lot of those logistics and then um, doing stuff for the, the organization we were based with. And he was going to be working in media. So it was he had been working for a television station um, back in, well, actually in Iowa before Kansas City. So he, he had that bend. And like he said, he likes to hide in, you know, small, dark places and not, not have to deal with the people as much. So it was just a kind of a perfect blend of um, our interests mm -hmm. and skill sets coming together. And we like, okay, yeah, we'll go. We'll, we'll give it two years. You know, we've never been there, sight unseen, hadn't ever even met any of the people we'd be working with. <laughs> didn't, didn't have a real clear understanding of anything we were getting into. What year was this? 2005. And we left January 2005. Yep, right at the beginning. So our, like we said, our daughter was 18 months old, and we sold all of our wedding presents and packed everything up into six little suitcases and then took off um, for uh, land unknown. And over the course of the next 11 years, actually, our, our projects shifted a lot. So we did our first few years um, with this organization that was doing media work, um, serving in North Africa and the Middle East. Ben was doing a lot of traveling in and out of North Africa. Um, I was mostly doing hospitality there on the island of Malta. Um, and we had, then we went kind of transitioned from there into some other um, types of projects. I won't take a lot of time to list them all, but. Um, well, like church planting. Church planting? Locally church planting, and and then... Um, Just like it sounds. Yeah. Starting a church. Yeah. I mean, yeah. there's... Eh. In, a, in a sense, it wasn't necessarily a traditional setup. It was more trying to serve the local churches that were there, and then eventually the Mediterranean region. So there were some... Uh, it was the Mediterranean Regional Prayer Center was our... Hmm. Was the thing we started, and we... And that was, that was full on for years. We did that for um, seven, eight years. Yeah, and then the refugee work. So that was, yep. um, there was a lot of, throughout the Arab Spring, and um, just lots of upheaval in the lands surrounding the Med. So, um, you were there during the Arab Spring uprisings in Tunisia and Algeria and Libya and all yep. of those mm -hmm. countries. So yeah. you were able to witness that mm -hmm. firsthand. Yeah. I believe we had a, a hand in it. And I can, oh, you, oh, we, can we can talk about that if you want, but yeah. <laughs> I mean, you can't you, say that and then leave me hanging. You like can't leave me censored, hanging. Maybe. <laughs> no. um, yeah, definitely. That was. How did? Um, what was your role in the Arab Spring? So it started in Tunisia, and it, the um, the focus country for us was Tunisia. Focus and country for our organization. For, yeah, for organization, and this was when we were working with the Media Missions Group. Um, it was called Lighthouse at the time, and we had. Um, been developing television shows in a basement in Malta, a basement studio, and the people on this show um, were Tunisians. And for the first time ever, there was a local Christian pastor, an indigenous pastor that had 
gone on television to publicly confess his faith and join with others who were also Tunisian um, to talk about what Christi- what, Chris- what Christianity is like in their country and why they believe it is the, the, the way to a much better life than, say, Islam, <laughs> which was the dominant religion. So um, <clears throat> this show began having quite an impact, um, and it got addressed on a state level in Tunisia. And there was quite a bit of resistance um, on the Internet, um, local newspapers. Um, of course, this, this pastor was then uh, receiving death threats and getting attention locally as well. And he became a public figure, eventually having a bullhorn in, um, in the revolution that started in Tunisia. And there was lots of talks of him becoming the new prime minister of Tunisia because he had such a huge support base. And the things he was saying were, one, they were very nationalistic, you know, and he was talking about Tunisia itself needing to be led in a much better way but with his Christian values. And that's, wow. that's very disruptive. And so I think one, I want to highlight one moment <clears throat> of that story because something that was super impactful even for us as Westerners was um, at a point, it was after several days of rioting in the capital, and the, there were a lot of you know, people from various religions that were fleeing the country. They were trying to get out because they were afraid for their safety. He was, at, as Ben mentioned, at the forefront of some of this... Um, uh, public, uh, you know, disrespect, let's say. And his response to that publicly was to say, listen, church, let's get out and clean up the trash. And he took families and invited them to join him in the square and start cleaning up the mess. And it was such a, such a public statement of humility and saying, this is what the church does. We don't have to, we don't have to try and convince people to change their beliefs or, or, or switch to our way of thinking, let's go serve. And it was, it was that that started to really draw the attention to be like, okay, this guy leads differently. And so, yeah, you can carry on with what you were saying, but it, 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 was, a, it was definitely, this the was, country took note. So what year was this? 2007, right, is when Tunisia... Eight? 2007 or eight. Might have been nine, actually. But <clears throat> maybe 2011... I was yeah, it was 2011. It started, and it started with yeah. one man. I don't know. Many who people don't know the story. So there was one man who um, was simply trying to sell things in a market, like vegetables or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but the police state was so oppressive that they shut him down because he didn't have his license. And it's extremely difficult to get things like licenses because there's so much bureaucracy. Um, so, in protest, he set himself on fire in the marketplace. Okay, and that is what started everything. So one man on fire started a revolution that was multi-country, right? And um, there was, yeah, that's a little known story, but it's it's a big deal. And of course, the parallels philosophically, religiously, (laughs) one man on fire can change part of a globe. This, this is, this is amazing. I mean, you were witnesses to this history. You were surrounded by it. You had a family you were apparently instrumental. I mean, your AV background, mm-hmm. you were in media before in Kansas City? Uh, in, in Iowa. I was working Iowa. with a television company. Uh, it was like a local TV station. What were you doing for them? Uh, field work, editing, um, not a ton, but I got, I got my teeth cut on analog. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Literally cutting this yes. in there. Okay. Yeah. So you and your wife and your family are in Tunisia. You've been church planning, I think you call it, planting, you've called it, which is, it sounds like, facilitating the growth of these organizations, these these Christian organizations. Mm -hmm. And in the course of that, you are able to give airtime, for lack of a better word, to this this man. Who, Who is the fellow you're talking about, the one who is saying, this is my life in yeah, Christianity. His first name is Ahmed, and he's now a very public figure. Um, he's, he's, got a, he's a bit of a celebrity on, on Arabic television now. They did so have every, to everybody leave Tunisia, though. Yeah, no he doesn't in live Tunisia. in Tunisia anymore, but uh, eventually he became kind of a, an international figure. Ahmed? Ahmed, yeah. And is, he's the guy that, that you all helped 
slingshot effectively. And it sounds like a man of incredible conviction, Mm -hmm. Uh, having the fortitude to speak out against what would have been an established, not just legal structure, but religious structure, Mm -hmm. and be an outcast, Mm -hmm. subject to death threats. He was putting his... He was walking the walk. This wasn't just a yeah. talk for him broadcasting right. no, he, from the safety of some yeah. foreign land. He was there. Took yeah. a huge risk. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah, he actually lost his job. And did they, did they ever give him his doctorate? I don't think they ever gave him his degree. Yeah, that was in legal battles. I'm not sure what the finality of that was. But, yeah, he was caught up in, in all kinds of drama because he was a professor as well at a, at a college in wow. Tunisia. So. so how did you go then from, I mean, where, right. where do you go from there, you two? Like you're you're in Tunisia. We just helped this happen. What what? I mean that that must have been an amazing experience. Yeah, it was. Um, so we we uh, did have a. I mean, it, it, we don't have a high tolerance for extended BS, and so um, the organization that we were working with there was struggling on many levels, and it became somewhat of a toxic environment. And so um, we knew that it was time to move on uh, from the media organization. <clears throat> and it just happened to coincide with something that we were experiencing on the church planting side, which really was just Eve um, playing a piano and singing and spending some time in prayer in this little basement church space that we were not even renting out. We were just given to use, to gather in. But that started to grow, and uh, we started experiencing uh, some pretty exciting and dynamic spiritual things in that space. And um, I could say that uh, we had such strong spiritual experiences, it became obvious that there was a different path that was being put in front of us. And um, I no longer felt like we were supposed to be giving all of our attention to media work. <clears throat> and it, was, it wasn't cool to go into those countries as an American anymore anyway, so um, that wasn't really going to happen. So we, um, we gave our time uh, with, you know, we got consultations from our home base here in America and lots of advice from other people, and it seemed like there was a, a yes, like go this direction. So we, we put our entire lives into this church plant, basically. And for years, we um, were sort of like a, an aircraft carrier for the Mediterranean, which is what Malta is, mm-hmm. in a sense, right? It's just a, a stationary yeah, aircraft carrier. And so uh, socially, religiously, we became that as well, uh, our organization did. And so we did a lot of stuff in Southern Europe and in North Africa, and um, we hosted conferences and lots and lots of missionary teams, short-term missionary teams. Um, so I think one of the, one of the kind of most basic roles or that we served there was just in being a connection point. So we, we had space, we had relationships with people with, from a number of different, you know, Christian denominations and outside of the Christian church as well. Um, and so it was just a point of bringing people together to see, various visions being moved forward. So um, we we had the unique privilege of hosting, yeah, like he said, a lot of teams, a lot of young people on, you know, college missions trips or humanitarian um, journeys that we got to, to connect with worthy projects and um, help host. And so our next few years after the media project, um, after that chapter sort of closed, we spent, was it five years doing the house of prayer? And it was, the idea was just really to be a service to the, the church as a whole, not a, not a, when we say church planting, it sounds like we were trying to plant our own version or brand of, um, church. And that wasn't it. It was really more to be a service to, um, the church in general and the population there in general. So our, our focus went from being only North Africa and the Middle East, kind of the the Arabic-speaking world, to being all of the Mediterranean region, so like you said, um, Southern Europe and, and stuff like that. And we we facilitated, um, a, yeah, a gathering place for people in different different arenas to come and connect in order to see their projects moved forward. 
Yeah, and a lot of those projects had to do with the refugee crisis that was happening. Yeah. So the sub-Saharan Africans were landing in Malta because of the currents, right? So they'd set off literally with, just rafts being pulled. Well, yeah, yeah. and then Maltese in. waters were huge in comparison to the rest of the country's waters. So anybody, as long as they could get off the coast of Libya and you know get a few miles out, they would be in Maltese waters and could send up a distress signal, and Maltese would have to pick them up. So at at kind of the peak of that, there were. I mean, was it 10,000 refugees landing on the shores of Malta in a year? Um, in a tiny country. Like we're talking tiny. half a million is the population. And, yeah. and so when you start adding tens of thousands of people flooding in, 100% dependent on, well, the European Union is, is what it ended up being. Like Malta was getting paid to harbor these refugees. So but that was, was one incentive, actually. That was a hot button issue, though, for the years that we were there and certainly very divisive topic as it is in America as well. <laughs> yep. um, but you, you were, you were again, witnesses to this history, you know, these mm-hmm. historic events. Mm-hmm. And, and you said small in terms of population as far as Malta goes, but of course it's also small geographically. Yeah. We're yeah. talking yeah. about... Like seven by 13 or something like that. <laughs> yeah, it's, just, well, it's smaller than like Metro Orlando. I, I was yeah. just going to say, yeah, we're talking about smaller. a city-sized yes. country, yes. you know, and resources cannot be that, no. you know, prevalent. No. So mm-hmm. you... You, you were able to see this sea of humanity, mm-hmm. and, it, and it can't, you know, you said hot button, right? Mm. It, it just doesn't seem like it could have been nearly as cut and dry mm-hmm. as, as maybe media reports would have described. I mean, you would have yeah. seen, you know, people from every walk of life in yeah. every emotional state. Yeah. What was that like? Yeah, that was, um, yeah, it was just really hard. I, um... I'll try not to get emotional. Um, the, so I, my heart was just burdened for, I mean, certainly I had the understanding of the, Mal, you know, the common Maltese perspective of like, these people are here, they're trying to take over their, those are my tax dollars paying for them to get their new cell phone. Like all those perspectives, I heard it and I had compassion for that, but my heart was really broken for um, those that were landing in a, uh, you know, in a place that was pretty much hostile to them um, with no understanding of the language and almost no life skills besides survival. Um, So during, um, gosh, I wish I had a timeline in front of me, but I ended up going and just uh, visiting a refugee camp, connecting with some of the administrative um, folks there and offering my services as an English teacher. So I didn't have mm. a lot to offer, but... Um, do, do you speak Arabic or French or... or not much. And, and actually, the few years there, that, that was really the peak of my involvement. Most of them were Somali coming over, and I definitely don't speak any Somali. Um, but hmm. we, uh, we... I would go and sometimes take my little girl, um, three years old, whatever, <laughs> with me, and just sit in a room and... They would put the word out that people could go and learn English if they wanted to. And so we had, you know, people with zero ability to speak English. Maybe one would come in who had learned a few words and he would serve as a translator. Um, And I would sit with them and there were, there are so many stories that I could tell, but um, one that really impacted me and, um, so kind of set a little bit of a trajectory was a woman who she had a little bit of English. So I, I would go mostly into the family camp. So this was women that had come. They had, you know, no husband or um, maybe had children with them or else they were young men who were under the age of 18. Mm-hmm. And so those were most of my students. Um, but there was a woman who had come that, that had a, just a littlest bit of English and that day nobody else showed up and so I was just sitting with her and trying to trying to ask her story you know using Mm -hmm. what little words we we had you know children family Mm -hmm. you know um and she sat and with tears in her eyes she told me that she had left behind five children um because she had had you know through the the rumor mill had had heard that she could come and she could work, and she would be able to send money home, which was the, you know, that was what they all understood. But she had left them with her mother, who was 
unwell. The oldest child was 12, and his job was to go out every day and scavenge for food. So nobody mm-hmm. had work, but he was the one who would go out, and she would do her best to um, get phone cards or mm-hmm. whatever she could from, from the little stipend that they were given here in the camp because she was unable to work. They didn't, she didn't have papers. There was, there was no way for her to actually get work. So she basically had shown up on an island thinking she had left her children behind only to give them a better life, and she got there and was essentially imprisoned. Um, and in the refugee in the refugee processing center, yeah, camp, yeah, basically, because there was there, there was no way to move forward with her her paperwork. Um, <clears throat> and so she would use what little stipend she had to try and get phone cards to stay in touch. And the last time that she had called, um, her son had gone out for food and had never come home. <sighs> and she was pretty confident that he was dead. So it was down to, she had, her oldest now was an eight-year-old daughter, and it was going to be her job to, to get food for the family, and she knew what that entailed and what that meant. And then her mom was very unwell. She had gotten word that her mom was very unwell. So I just sat there, and I'm like, I have nothing. There's nothing that I can do for you. Like, all I can do is sit here and hold your hand and cry because my, like, Oh, I will pray for them. That was, it was useless in the face of her suffering and her hopelessness and the knowledge that probably, you know, within the year, her whole family would be dead. Um, and that was something that just, I had to, I had to wrestle for a while with that realization. Like, what am I doing? I could, I could try to affect policy changes, but like my my voice is pretty small and what do I have in front of me but the conclusion that I came to was I mean the biblical story of the the loaves and fishes right there's a huge crowd of people that are hungry and need fed and maybe all I have is a little basket of you know like a couple of loaves and fish but I can bring it and it's the only thing I can do is just trust that somehow what I have to offer is going to be expanded. Somehow I will be able to affect change, even if I can't save this woman's family and her life. And if all I had to offer in that moment was a hug and a handhold and a crying together and a solidarity with and a few words of English, maybe impart some hope, that was what I was going to do. And so um, we had... A uh, number of yeah teams, university teams that would come over, and we would take them in, and we would communicate that like don't expect that you're going to change these people's lives right now. Like don't don't think that your your friendship is going to um, heal Somalia and everything that's taking place there. But come in and offer what you have, and trust that you know it's going to make a difference somehow down the line. You're not you are not powerless. Um, so we did that for a number of years. The refugee work, nutrition classes. Um, we did take in a family for a brief season when they, when Libya was all falling apart that was, he actually had an American citizenship as well, but his family didn't. And so they were in transition trying to get to the States and didn't have, couldn't be in Libya, couldn't be in America yet. And so they were living in our basement for a while. We um, helped with a couple of families that were able to get refugee status in the United States and connected them with our family here and, um, you know, helped with their transition process. Um, but again, it was a drop in the bucket. What, what we had to offer. This is, this is a profound story. You know, it, it transcends borders, cultures, languages. This was just human to human sharing that pain and that grief and that's the thing when you guys talk about Eden's Abbey I had no idea but I can see it in you in your face both of you that you mean it when you say that's why we do this work to try to 
help. And as you said, even if it's just literally holding a hand, Mm -hmm. shedding a tear, Mm -hmm. or metaphorically doing that by taking your profits, it sounds like, and then going and trying to continue that. Knowing, by the way, as you said, it was a drop in the bucket, but that at least it's a drop. Yeah. Sounds like that's what you guys have, have seen all the way from Kansas City to that. That's profound. And you've gone through tragedy yourself. You've seen it, but you've gone through it yourself. Mm-hmm. If you, I, I, know, I know you put it in, in your message to me, and I was talking to Ben about this a little bit beforehand. I, I almost hesitate to even touch that, but how you, you lost your daughter. Yeah. Yeah, so when we, <clears throat> when we stopped with the Mediterranean Regional Prayer Center and handed that over and... Uh, to some locals and um, the refugee work was dwindling to some degree Um, uh, we spent a couple of months okay so we our daughter was born and in 2013 and she had a congenital nerve disorder which called which caused uh, some paralysis of the face and also some like it slowed down her growth process and she was very dependent 100 percent dependent on us um, so we, uh, we had a lot going on, a lot to think about. And we were in the States for about seven months dealing with, with that after she was born, um, helping her with some therapy cause she was having um, five to 10 severe seizures a day. And, um, those were, those were taken care of for the most part, which was fantastic through some therapy she received here in the States. But, um, while we were here, we had some other very interesting thing ha- things happen. We stayed in Kansas City for a while as well. And when we came back to Malta, we knew our lives, our life had changed. And that the, the things that we were going to be involved in were not what we were doing prior to that. And so we sat on that and developed some concepts for a while. And that turned into the pub, which was mm-hmm. basically the, the community that had been built, the, the, the friendship networks that had been built um, around the prayer center and the refugee work um, were the undercurrent for this pub. And we, we had an understanding that um, the church as we know it, which is a place where people gather and you try to get more and more people because you want to do projects and you want to fund those projects and the salaries and everything of the people running it. Um, that's one model, that's one approach, but it's definitely not the only approach. And we found that um, with a community of faith as the support structure for this pub, we actually had deep relationships with a wide variety of people that would never set foot in a traditional church setting. Does that make sense? It sounds like you're saying that you can find the spirituality almost anywhere and that the hospitality, the loaves and fishes that that Eve was talking about, Mm -hmm. you realized was actually a vector for that, perhaps a, a lesser known, lesser used vector. Yeah, absolutely. And that in both the metaphorical and literal sense, feeding their stomachs and feeding their hearts mm-hmm. and their souls mm-hmm. was what, what you guys decided was viable. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, breaking bread together or providing food and hospitality for people is is timeless, and everybody wants that. And that is everybody the, wants it. That, yeah. that is the natural place for humans to connect. Yeah. In a church building, it's not necessarily reflective of our everyday lives, which also has its benefits, right? Because we kind of remove ourselves from our, the norm to focus on one thing. So that has value. But the other days of the week, the relevant space to meet in is over a meal and a beer mm-hmm. for some. <laughs> so we, um, we found that to be um, explosive in terms of community. We've done a lot of evangelistic work. We've done a lot of missions work where we're trying to convey principles and ideas and encounters with God to many people. And we've seen tons of that happen. It's fantastic what, what we'd seen God do in our lives and through our community. But what happened in that little pub was different. It was so, so huge and so like overwhelming. <laughs> so we were both putting in 80 hours a week and we had a special needs child. We had three other kids. And By this time, you had three other children. Yeah, yeah. So oh, wow. four two of them were born. Well, three of them were born born in Malta. You, you both just hated sleep. That's what it came down to. You're like, <laughs> let's get like into it. the yeah, hospitality yeah, yeah. business. Yeah, yeah. We have yeah. four children. No, sleep. No. We're allergic to yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Yes. 
Turns well, out. you know, life is about sacrifice. So uh, <laughs> it was going full speed ahead. And then um, one morning, October 26th of 2015, um, we woke up and she was gone. Like she, she was, she'd passed away in her sleep and she was two years old. Liliana was her name. And, um, pub life is full speed ahead and lots and lots of eyes and conversations every day, all day. And we knew that that couldn't be the, our life at that moment from that point on. And so, um, we, uh, we took a break, we closed things down. Um, put a piece of paper on the pub door and um, we ended up moving back to the States within a couple of months because we had to heal. Um, pub life is not for the weak at heart. Um, our marriage was being impacted severely by lack of time to communicate. Um, Spoiler alert, we're always wrong. I know. Yeah, it turns out. Yeah. He learned. We can fix. We, there's no fight that can't be yeah. cured with that, right? You're 100% right. You look great in that. I'm right. I'm wrong. You're right. Yeah. Whatever you want to do. You're a wise man. Yeah. I've been in the trenches, too, for a little while. <laughs> yeah, we're both very stubborn people, which has been spicy. <laughs> it's been spicy. That's a different podcast. Yeah, so... Yeah, we lost Liliana, um, and we knew we needed to heal up as a family, so we came back to the States um, and spent some time in Georgia in a cabin on the side of a mountain. And we were gifted that time to heal, which, you know, a lot of people don't have that. They just got to keep plugging away and doing the grind, but we, we were given space to heal. And that was really powerful um, for us as a family. We, we transitioned back into the States that way, uh, and in, we have a support community in in Central Florida <clears throat> through Eve's family and kids with similar ages, cousins, that kind of thing, friends. And so coming back to this area made sense. Um, we had only planned to be here for maybe a year or two to get our feet back on the ground in, in the States um, and then see what happened next. Um, but yeah, that leads into the next few years after that, which were pretty wild as well. So. <clears throat> um, I got invited to, uh, this is all leading up to the, to the why of Eden Abbey as well. Like the real, the real nuts and bolts of the why of Eden Abbey. Um, we, uh, I got invited to do some more freelance video projects and, um, went to Tunisia, did some stuff like deep in the desert. Um, uh, that was the only time I was ever afraid for my life in those countries. Um, there was a, we were near the Algerian border. And I was doing a video shoot there. Um, it was a documentary on some on the indigenous people of North Africa before the Arabic Muslims came and took over the region. Um, they were the Berber people. So we were doing some documentary work on them and the spiritual history of the Berber people. And uh, we were deep in the desert. And I was, I was watching one of the guys that was kind of hanging around, and his behavior bothered me. Um, and I'm behind the, cam I'm behind the camera. Uh, this is a local guy. Um, something about him didn't feel right. And um, videoing an interview, interviewing this local guy, and I start hearing a shout, like from my chest, inside my chest, get out now. And so I'm sitting like, oh, okay, that's weird. You know, I'm just going to suppress that. That's just me being... <laughs> That's just me being dramatic. Get out now. Like it was like this shout inside of my chest. And I, I don't know how else to describe it. And I'm looking around and I'm starting to sweat. My, my heart's starting to pound. And when I start to sweat, my heart's starting to pound. I know I need to pay attention to that. And um, so I said, I'm sorry. We got to stop and leave right now. And everybody's looking at me like, what, what do you mean? And so within five minutes, we had packed up all of our gear and um, got into our little land cruiser and hightailed it out of there. But on our way out, um, the guy that I felt uncomfortable about, I saw him on the phone talking really quiet behind a wall. And as soon as I came around the wall, he was like, oh, oh hi, you know, like he looked shocked that I have, was there. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I can't point to that and say, okay, well, we got chased by guys in a pickup with, you know, AK-47s. That didn't happen. But that was the only time 
that I was aware of, of the actual, you know, space that we were in that had danger. Everything else was like, whatever, I'm in the moment, it, it doesn't matter. Um, that was a fun story, but <clears throat> it didn't stop me from going other places. So I went on a, a trip uh, with another friend and we ended up in northern Iraq doing a, a video shoot. And this was... You got some interesting friends. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the network I'm talking about. Hey, that? man. Yeah. Let's go to Tunisia and Algeria. Yeah. We'll just do some some videography there. Yeah. <laughs> Tell Felt really stories. weird about that. <laughs> Let's go to northern Iraq. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You're, you're the cradle of civilization as we know it, basically. We're close to it anyway. Yeah. Right? And the hotbed of ISIS at the time. Uh, it was, this was just after ISIS had devastated Iraq. Um, and regime changes were happening. There's all kinds of horrible stuff going on. Um, so we were... Now, you're a Caucasian guy in the middle of the hotbed of, mm-hmm. in many cases, anti-Western yeah. sentiment. Well, I'm, and I'm bald, and I have a, a chin beard, which makes me look even worse. Yes. <laughs> How are you... And I only wear American Eagle shirts where they're tearing through the flag, you know? <laughs> With Trump giving a thumbs up on the back. <laughs> How are you able to function in these areas? I, you, you don't speak Arabic? Not much, no. And Arabic changes from country to country anyway. So the Tunisian Arabic that I had gotten quite a bit of education on didn't work. In, really? In Iraq, not really, no. So, um, yeah, I mean, the, the answer to that like how is friendships, Hmm. quiet humility. And they, they're used to the American presence in Northern Iraq military anyway. Mm. Um, So seeing my face and if I've got a passport and I don't look like I'm packing, then it's not a big deal. It's interesting how you two share this commonality because Eve, you were talking about the human element. You shared someone's experiences Mm -hmm. And Ben, just now, you were in a place where you should have been harmed. I mean, just statistically speaking, with everything we were joking about, you should have been harmed. And yet, you just described the same thing that your wife described, the human element Mm -hmm. and humility. And I mean, you're a big guy. You're, you're, You're tough, you know. You don't have to take on that air of humility if you didn't want to. But you did. And you survived. And there's even more to this story. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, I I like to have a hard shell and a liquid yolk interior. Gooey like center. A, yes, gooey center. <laughs> Gross. I'm like a really old Twinkie. <laughs> <laughs> Which supposedly doesn't affect their edible right, status. You can still eat it. Yeah, yeah. Still nutritious on some level. All right. Before I interrupted you, you had this moment where every fiber of your being said, we don't need to be there. Mm. And it sounds like what you witnessed was that someone was laying a pretty clear cut ambush trap, whatever you want to call it, whether it be to kidnap and use, use whatever that would have affected or whether it be to just take our equipment or, or or worse. Yeah. Right. Right. Who knows what the point is. You felt that once in your life, you knew it was time to listen to it. You did. You're here to tell the story. Mm -hmm. That's what matters. Mm -hmm. But from there, you don't back down. You don't say, okay, that spooked me. I'm done. You say, get back on the horse. Yeah. So Northern Iraq, here we come. Yeah. I, I'd, I'd heard in the media what had happened to the Yazidi people. Mm. Um, they're still in the media time, from time to time trying to get international support because there's no solution to their situation. But What is, in a nutshell, just so we know what we're talking about, what is their situation? So they were the main target of ISIS in Iraq. They're a, they're a people group that are um, somewhat Kurdish in their, in their blood history. And their religion is more like um, Zoroastrian, kind of like a really ancient. Very old. Very old. Predates Islam, predates yes. Christianity. Yes. And originated in Iran or that area? Yeah, like northeastern Iraq, Iran, southwestern Iran, that kind of thing. So they have a huge, you know, an ancient history and have been persecuted and almost wiped off the planet several times because of them holding on to their... It's, it's like if... It's like if the Amish were desperately hated by, um, you know, Christians and Islams in America. They're just very hidden, very closed off, very strict rules about society, mostly just farmers and 
small merchants, um, somewhat of like a gypsy lifestyle, but they do have settlements. Um, so we're, we're driving up to this tiny little village, um, to connect with somebody there and, and just do some videography, um, about the Yazidi situation, which I'm not very educated on. And, um, we come up, we come up to a, <clears throat> excuse me, we come up to a school. I haven't thought about this in a while. Uh, we come up to this school, uh, but it's an off day and there's this little girl. She's probably six or seven years old and she comes out to greet us. But you know, that thousand yard stare that soldiers have when they've been through the worst of humanity. Um, she had that look in her eyes and I'd never seen that in a child before. And, um, I, I, it just kind of shut me down and I wasn't, I wasn't sure what to do. Uh, so we took our video and it just felt so cheap taking video. It's like, what are we doing? You know? Uh, and we, uh, I just went back to our little, uh, it was like a bed and breakfast thing in, in one of the major cities there in Northern Iraq and De Hook. And I just wept for like 12 hours. I didn't, I didn't really know what was happening to me, um, but <clears throat> it was like I was getting a download of what had happened to these people and their desperate situation and how God deeply cares for them. And they are a disregarded um, people group that nobody really cares about because they don't necessarily have a voice or an impact on the global scene. But there's, they were um, completely devastated. So the, the women were taken into sexual slavery uh, by ISIS. The kids were also taken into slavery. Uh, most of the men uh, were killed. And the families were tortured in front of each other. And they, the Islamic nation ha justified that because of their religious beliefs that these people, because they are who they are, um, they basically don't have any human rights. So the majority of this population in northern Iraq had been devastated and there were still tens of thousands of women in, in slavery, uh, in either in Syria or in other hidden pockets of Iraq. And, uh, these families were torn apart and this girl had watched her family get tortured in front of her. This one that I encountered, um, and they had, they had nobody helping them except, um, some NGOs that had come into the country. And, um, there was this little school that was, just taking care of kids and trying to minister to the remaining adults in the area. And, um, we ended up raising funds to, uh, take over that school because, uh, Samaritan's purse was ending their project in that location, which is a big uh, international, um, NGO. And they were moving on more to the war front. Um, to, to set up hospitals. And so the school was going to be abandoned and all these kids who had been dependent on other people, uh, locals and internationals coming in to take care of them and keep feeding them and teaching them and caring for them and counseling them. Those people are going to be gone and there was just a gap to be filled. And so we raised support, um, and we became the, the funding agency. We started a, a little nonprofit here in the States that, um, and so we would go back and forth to Iraq and, and just take care of these kids and, organize the teachers and organize the, the funding to supply everything. Is that organization still functioning? Technically we renew it and we have, um, we have a structure there. Do you accept donations and yeah. so forth? Okay. We'll give it some press cause we got to make sure <laughs> okay. if you don't, if you don't publicize yourself, <clears throat> who will, yeah. what's the name of the organization? Uh, it's called peace Lily peace Lily. Yeah. And um, how can people find it? Well, we do have a website. It's a little outdated and not so that the funds that we receive now are more just through person to person donations. And those, that money is used to continue taking care of people. But the school itself was abandoned because there was another big scare, uh, in the area and the Yazidi people dispersed. And so the village that we were once taking care of and, and working with isn't even there as far as we know now. Um, and the money that was supplying the school dried up in 2017. And there was like, I don't, if you remember 2017, there were like a dozen major horrible things that happened in the world. 
and everybody got like uh, compassion exhaustion and money was being sent all different directions and we were just one tiny little voice saying well what about these guys so compassion uh, exhaustion yeah <laughs> uh, and we uh, so the funding dried up and the reason we started Eden Abbey um, one of the main reasons was to so that we wouldn't have to keep asking for money, but we would instead uh, generate revenue to start up these works again in a more intentional way and get back overseas. Wow. So, yeah. Um, but so peacefully, yeah, we do have a website, peacefully.org, um, and the, the money now goes to uh, a very trusted friend, a local, and he... In northern Iraq. In northern Iraq and, and the Hook area. And he disperses funds to desperate families um, and just helps. So it's, it's our way of staying connected. You know, because then COVID happened and we weren't allowed to travel anyway. And there was lots of interruptions to, to our connection over there. Um, and we are just now connected through relationship and a little bit of funds going there from time to time, which I'm sure looks great, me sending money through Western Union to Iraq <laughs> every month. <laughs> so. Well, anybody that has questions as to the why can just oh, yeah. listen to what you just, both of you have just said here today and mm -hmm. have zero doubts as to its legitimacy. No. With everything you've been through, and it's been a lot, is your faith stronger? Absolutely. I went through a nine month period of wondering if it was going to survive. Um, I was very angry with God for what he did not do when I needed him most. Um, it took a while for me to listen to the question that I think is in all of our minds if we're paying attention to God, which was, do you believe that I'm good? That was the question that God was asking me and uh, he chased me down <laughs> every day he chased me down uh, I had to, to learn to trust again <clears throat> um, you know if you had a best friend who was a genius in the surger, surgical room and your child was was dying and you knew that that friend was the only one that could save her and he stood there and didn't save her and just looked at you and said don't worry I'll be here it's like yeah great I'm, I'm glad you're going to be here but I need you to save her right now and he doesn't what do you do with that friend do you stay friends and that was a very complicated thing to work out in my own heart you know it was yeah I, I, the answer eventually was yes I believe that he's good <laughs> And I think when people go through suffering and come out on the other end with a deeper sense of trust and grounding and calling, um, it becomes very unshakable. Um, yeah. I knew, you, I knew this was going to be an interesting conversation. I had no idea how deep and how touching it was going to be i'm tremendously grateful for the two of you to the two of you for for being willing to share but i'll say this <laughs> one it makes me feel exponentially better about every beer that i buy from you <laughs> <laughs> beer with a conscience <laughs> this is this is why i'm so thrilled that you agreed to come on the show and I think that a lot of people are going to be as well. It sounds like you've seen what I'm going to call the fakers, the posers. You guys are describing things in a, in, a, in a way, and it's interesting, the language, the specific words you've used, church planting, compassion exhaustion, things like that. Most people would generically refer to people who have done what you have done as missionary work. And there are probably some skeptics out there as to whether or not everybody who undertakes things that they refer to as missionary work are in fact doing them for perhaps the right reasons. Mm -hmm. 
I'd say the vast majority of people who do it, of course, are doing it for the right reasons. Yeah. But, you know, anytime you hear things about, like, for instance, aid organizations that perhaps, you know, they take, you know, for every one dollar that they get in, if a penny ends up going to the cause at issue, yeah, absolutely. that's a success. Yeah, yeah. So there seems to be some, some skepticism that has arisen mm-hmm. around that. You two suffer from being lumped into that just by association. Yeah, sure. Lawyers, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <sighs> <laughs> the good ones and the bad ones. They all basically share the same, you know, reputation. For the better or for worse. Very evil. <laughs> <laughs> but you guys have actually walked the walk. You're the real thing. I mean, there there there's this amazing passion that comes from both of you, distinct and yet similar. And, and the idea, you know, that someone says, oh, I started, a, I started a brewery so that I can donate money to people in need abroad. I mean, you have to have encountered people who are like, okay, sure. <laughs> yeah, a lot of church people mm-hmm, have mm-hmm. a problem with it. <laughs> mm-hmm. And business people. It's not a good business and, model. And alcohol, no less, because <laughs> right, there's right. always that, too. And you're like, wait yeah. a minute, wait a minute, into wine, remember that part of it, too. <laughs> Don't forget that part. <laughs> but, but then there's nobody, nobody who's going to listen, not just listen, because that's why we've got cameras, to see in your eyes, both of you, the sincerity. You've been touched by pain. You've seen it. You've lived it. You've felt it. There is nothing about your story that is anything other than completely sincere. That's... It's, it's amazing to see it. Now... How do people find you? We we got we talked about Peace Lily. We've heard we've heard you name your business. It's Eden's Abbey. Eden Abbey, yeah. Eden Abbey. Eden, Eden Abbey. Yeah. No possessive. <laughs> right. right. Gotcha. Eden. Common mistake. Common mistake. Yeah. Eden Abbey. It's located in Mount Dora. How do people find you? Yeah. Great. What's the address? 405 South Highland Street, Mount Dora, Florida. You have an Instagram account. At Eden Abbey Brewing. Okay. Are you on the book face? Eden Abbey Brewing. Yeah. Okay. Anywhere else? <laughs> website or? Yeah, website is EdenAbbeyBrewing.com. Okay. And, of course, we're going to have all these links in the descriptions. Mm-hmm. But sure. um, shameless plug time. You guys have a really family-friendly place, which yeah. is unique in many ways. Um, although we've been starting to see it, it seems like a trend is starting to arise where you have, you know, that pub feel. And people forget what pub means. They've just heard pub. They just right. know pub. Yeah. Pub. It's like a bar, right? right. No. no. Public house. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Public house was usually a gathering place for pe- for families. Mm-hmm. So you guys have that whole play area that's screened in, which in Florida, big right. deal because the bugs yeah. cannot absolutely lay waste to your family while yeah. the little ones are playing with the blocks and all that kind of stuff that you have. And then you have that beautiful outdoor back garden area, right? Mm-hmm. When the weather's nice, no mm-hmm. better place to be. That's right? true. And then, of course, you have the actual inside. And I've been, I've been following you know, your, your Instagram page. You've had all kinds of really cool acts. You actually have a lot of really good musical acts coming in. Yeah, fantastic bands and musicians. Yeah, like really neat. I mean, it's kind of eclectic in a in a way, but I mean, just consistently good. That's mm-hmm. the commonality. Yeah. You've got new beers that you seem to be playing with all the time. Yeah, but the old standbys are great. And then you have, um, did I see this cupcake business? You're playing oh, around gosh. with cupcakes now. <laughs> we would we would like to start doing maybe some cupcake flights. It's, it's dabbling in, talks. in pastry. Yeah, we have a fantastic menu already, and our desserts are, you know, gaining notoriety, but. And yeah, you just, we're talking about a cupcake flight. You so. recently got a new head chef. We did, yes. And Eric. I mean, the menu is as good as it's ever been, but better and better it seems. Yes. Even. Yeah, we've we've kind of focused a little bit on more of a mm, like lunch menu and small bites and stuff too, because you know not everybody wants to have a full on dinner when they come in for a beer. So we're we've got we've got a little something for everybody, kids included. Ben and Eve, thanks so much for coming in. Thanks so much for talking. It's, it's our pleasure. Thank thanks you for so having much. us.